मुझे देख ताले बे मुंतजर मुझे देख शक I really like to read this because I read it out to most people. He says this about uh, Abdul Salam Saheb, and uh, uh, he's extremely complimentary about him. That there is no doubt in my mind that his work places him as the greatest physicist of the Islamic world for a thousand years. Not since Ibn Hisham and Al Biruni has there been a more influential figure in the field. Now, I, I, since I'm not a natural physicist, I think this is the best summary of what he's left behind and, and his impact on the world. Uh, personally, when I heard about Dr. Abdul Salam was when I was myself in grade eight, when uh, agitations against Ahmadis started. We used to live in Faisalabad at the, um, in those times, and I was very keen in performing Jamaat duties at that times. And uh, uh, a lot of elders would wake up at night and give duties to protect the village that we were living in. Within those duties, uh, you know, people talk about Jamaat's contribution to the world. They talked about Sazafurullah Khan. And they talked about how there is a great Ahmadi scientist. And they mentioned the name, Professor Dr. Abdul Salam. And I was so inspired that right there and then, I said, I want to do a PhD in physics as well. I had the pleasure of meeting him in 1974 in Italy. My father was serving as Pakistan's ambassador to Italy at the time. And Professor Salam Saab at that time was I think regularly commuting between Imperial College and uh, the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, which is now named after him, by the way. And so all I, I uh, can remember, it, this is, we're going back 51 years, so the little I remember is uh, his warmth and his humility. Dr. Abdul Salam, as I know, would keep a copy of the Quran in his pocket all the time. Right? And it's pretty well known to everybody. So faith was prime to him. Even in his office in Trieste, Italy, he had a verse of the Holy Quran, uh, pictures framed and put, it, put in his office. And he always mentioned that all the inspirations he got and ideas he got were from the Holy Quran. He found no conflict between his faith and his scientific work because uh, whenever he read the Holy Quran, he would find that it was the, the Word of God and the laws of God Almighty. Uh, there was no dichotomy there, he would say. And uh, if there was any, uh, he would say that he would turn to the Holy Quran. Uh, the, the first uh, few verses of Surah Al-Baqarah say, Zalik al kitabu la rayba fi hudal al muttaqeen and then he would say that it is uh, for those who Alladina yu'minuna bil ghayb, those who believe in the unseen. And so he would say that if there was anything that was uh, beyond the reach of physics or beyond the reach of uh, human understanding, it would fall under the unseen. He went to Cambridge to do his PhD. And personally, when I was doing a PhD, one of his professors met me and narrated his stories. He said, uh, one day I was sitting in the lab, after the lab, you know, I was having my lunch, then there was an elder, elderly man who came and asked if he can sit with me and have lunch. So I said, fine, uh, you can sit. And he asked me if I knew him, I, and I didn't know him. And so I said, I, I'm sorry, I don't know you. Uh, he says, you probably are from Pakistan. I said, yes. Uh, you must know Abdul Salam. I said, yes, I knew Abdul Salam. I know Abdul Salam very well. He said, I am Professor Schoenberg, his professor. And when he came to Cambridge, he was an excellent experimentalist as well. So, I mean, he excelled not only in theoretical physics, his professor is testifying that he was an excellent experimentalist 
as well, which he saw that I was an experimental physics, so he probably wanted to inspire me as well. You cannot escape knowledge. Science is knowledge. Knowledge is knowledge whichever way it's acquired. It's part of our culture. This is the scientific age. You cannot escape it. No one in the East can, no one in the West can. This is the scientific age. Before Abdul Salam and Weinberg, all the scientists agreed that the forces that are governing the world are fundamentally four forces. The gravitational force, which planets and all, you know, uh, run with, then the electromagnetic force, the weak and the strong nuclear forces. Abdul Salam and Weinberg, prior to that, these were the four fundamental forces that were defined. They proved theoretically first that weak nuclear forces and electromagnetic forces are one and the same thing. So the source of the forces can be, you know, exchanged. The forces can exchange. This combining of the two forces now left three fundamental forces. And the ultimate aim was to combine all of them and say this, the source of all the forces is one. And practically, that was to prove that there is only one force running the universe, and that's Allah the Almighty. And in their uh, theoretical formulation, Dr. Abdul Salam predicted that if this were to be true, then during the nuclear collisions that happen, you know, at the collide, hydron, uh, collider, you should observe W0 particles. That should be generated, that will balance the mass, and so and so forth. So all the formulations that they needed to work out. And I think it was about four or five years uh, after him predicting this, and Weinberg as well, independently, uh, they performed the experiments that they observed and detected the W particles. And that proved this, that what they were saying theoretically is also correct experimentally, and that actually solidified the law. So it became uh, the Slam weinberg theory and became the law of physics. Professor Sheldon Glashow, Abdus Salam and Steven Weinberg. He had a great desire to serve his country. And if you know, he died a Pakistani with Pakistani passport and had a desire to be buried there. Uh, in, he never changed his nationality, even at his Nobel Prize. And um, I don't know if you remember, but uh, Professor Saab was dressed in traditional Sherwani, you know, and uh, it, was quite, it looked very impressive. But the country always rejected him. We all know that the country still does not accept him as its hero. He, after doing his PhD, went back to Pakistan to serve in Pakistan and was appointed a professor at Government College, Lahore. But they sidelined him and appointed him a football coach at the college instead, you know, instead of benefiting the nation with his brilliance, they wanted him to teach or coach the soccer teams of the college. And there were other, of course, this was not the only frustration he had. Uh, there was no journals available. He wasn't permitted to perform research, things in which he passionately wanted to and wanted to bring all those things. Uh, he got so frustrated that he quit and left for England. When I finished my uh, doctorate in, in, at Oxford. I went back to Pakistan where I was working. And my, my uh, doctorate was in business studies. Nothing to do with physics. And a uh, Pakistani colleague of mine who knew I was an Ahmadi, he said, um, he asked me when I went back, he says, your, your Jamaat, your community must be very proud of you. So I said, uh, why? He said, well, you know, you've got a, a doctorate. 
I said, no, in our community, we have a higher standard. And he said, what do you mean? I said, well, you know, in our community, the standard is, is Abdus Salam. And he looked at me and said, I understand. I understand. So as far as inspiration goes, I think for all, for my generation who went into academics or uh, who, dis it was, the inspiration was excel. Whichever field you were in, whether it was natural sciences, whether it was social sciences, whether business management sciences, whatever you do, excel. If you were going to go into academia, um, aim for the, uh, for the terminal degree, you know, where, where you do your own research. And so that's, I can't think of any better inspiration than that actually for young people. I think that still holds true today.